three, two, one. Action. How is life since we finally got here? We finally, the film's finally out. Everyone's seen it. How's life now, man? Yeah. It, oh my God. It's been awesome. It's been, a, it's been a, it's been an awesome emotional uh, couple weeks for Kurt and I, uh, like, you know, like we talked about last time, this was a, this was a huge blessing that this even, this version of uh, our film even gets to see the light of day. And um, it seems like, uh, you know, the, 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 the prior uh, version that was out there uh, went a little bit under the radar. So um, it was nice to see a, a whole lot of wrestling fans get to experience it, it for the first time uh, in the way that we uh, intended to show it. Oh, I'm glad. No, and like, because when you, when we spoke last time, you told me this was like, well, I mean, if we can go back from when you first met Kurt, like 20, 12 when you did the Olympic short <laughs> if we count that it's like 11 years but if we carry it from like yeah. when you've started filming I think it's five years I think 2018 you started making this stock yeah and, right? if yeah. You go into, and if you go even deeper into when I wanted to become a, a feature filmmaker of uh you know you could go back to when I was 12 years old so it, it, it means a lot to have my first feature thing out there as well but yeah I yeah. met Kurt in 2012 we had a blast making that funnier dive video with uh, Rob Van Dam as well. Uh, yeah. Got to mention RVD because he's the man. Um, I've been able to stay in contact with RVD over the years as well, and he's he, he he's become a good friend um, to my brother and I. And oh. uh, but yeah, uh, you know, Kurt and I started the process on this documentary. I started texting him about it probably in 2016, I would say. Um, and then that's when we started. I started just like texting him here and there and getting the getting the story that uh, wasn't widely known yet, the, the, the Olympic story. And uh, I got really excited by that story. And I'm excited to see um, wrestling fans' reactions to it when they say it's kind of surreal to see it. Because that's, yeah. the, that's the exact reaction I was going for. I love seeing that word out there when I see it. Uh, because, you know, it is surreal to see someone comedically say, I won the Olympics with a broken freaking neck for 20 years and never really see the ins and outs of that story yeah no I, that is i think when i uh when i was writing up our previous conversation i think i used it in the article where <laughs> it was like he, he kept saying it and it just became a thing that we laughed about but when you watch especially when i watched the, the angle i was like oh bloody hell like the meaning behind this is like you said surreal like it was like and we we had the whole conversation about you know the prior version all that kind of stuff but None of that was in my head when I was watching it. I just watched this. It was a whole new thing. I was just engrossed. Like, as you said, the first hour is all about the Olympic journey. And yeah, it, surreal. Surreal is the word. And can I just say congratulations, man? Because oh, honestly, yeah. I'm not just saying it just because like, it's just, it was fantastic. Absolutely Thank fantastic. So Thank you so much. I, I really, really appreciate that. And, has, uh, has the reactions like been, has it all been kind of worthwhile if you if i must say like all the years all the years the build-up has it lived up to expectation yeah great question uh so it has you, you gotta remember i actually made this film uh for more so for with general audience the general audience in mind and not specifically now i i'm obsessed with wrestling fans i am yeah. a wrestling fan and i love wrestling fans and the film is sort of taken off in the in the wrestling world right now and um, I just like have been overwhelmed by that that reaction, and I'm extremely grateful for it because I always wanted to make like like I said something surreal for the wrestling fans. Now my next step would be to try and expand it into the general audience a little bit more, uh, because I do believe it's a human story for everyone to yeah. really to, to to really see. Um, so you know we're working on getting the word out in that way. Yeah, I, I never expected WWE to acquire this film. I always expected we made it independently, and I always expected it to end up uh, in, in, in some sort of outlet that wasn't under the WWE Universe banner. Now I'm very grateful it ended up under the WWE Universe banner. One, uh, we got to use all of WWE's footage <laughs> yeah. and many other things, you know, I got to weave in Kurt's theme song and all that stuff. Yeah. That was awesome. Um, two, they advertised the heck out of it for us. Yeah. And that was an amazing gift because 
you know, that's not even something that we asked for and they just gave it to us. So a uh, huge blessing to end up there and um, huge blessing to, to, to have this version out there and for wrestling fans to react the, the way that they did. So, um, I mean, uh, w- one thing I will say is for, for the fans who are um, a little bit peeved about the omissions in this, uh, <laughs> one, one, one uh, you know, my marching orders were to make a 90 minute doc and I had to scratch and claw to get that extra 18 minutes. That's one, two, yeah. Two, like I said, I very much intended this to be the most streamlined story possible in Kurt Angle's life for the general audience. Uh, you know, it, so when it comes to specific pro wrestling om- omissions, um, if there is interest out there, which I really hope there is someday, I would love to make the extended version of this. I would really love to. I have, I know exactly what I would do. A very rough version of that extended version exists. Uh, and I would say, you know, it would probably take me about three to four months to movieify it, to, 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 you know, really make it, uh, watchable. And, um, if, if we were to do that one day, uh, hopefully sooner than later, uh, I would think that the extended version would land somewhere between probably somewhere between like two and a half and three hours long, I would say. Wow. And, um, a few things that, you know, were, were omitted would absolutely be in there. Um, and I'd be excited to, to, to do it because I do think his life is so dense that, you know, the, 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 the criticism about omissions is correct. <laughs> it's correct. Like, <laughs> there are omissions here. I mean, yeah. and I would love to delve deeper into it and do that version someday if possible. Yeah, no, I mean, you, like we said last time, he's lived what, like three lives in one life the olympic journey wwe every, everything that's happened post wwe it's the man's <laughs> the man's done more than most can dream of like it's absolutely incredible very true and uh, to be honest i'm actually hoping that kurt angle has just started his third act of his life you know mm. uh i want the guy to be around and enjoy life for a very long time yeah and you know he has so much stuff to look forward to and i'm hoping that this film does a tiny part in bringing him um, some more like opportunity and joy in his life. Uh, cause that was, you know, that was my goal from day one. You know, he gave a lot to me when I was looking up to him as a fan. And this was my, uh, this is my way of giving back. I have a lot of other films I want to do where I give back to, uh, you know, certain people or certain subjects that I've really loved. Uh, and this is one I was able to do that with. And for a filmmaker, that's an extremely powerful thing to be able to, uh, do powerful for me, uh, yeah. to experience. Yeah, no, and I, I, you, you've done him justice, like absolutely done him justice, and I, and as a fan of him, like huge fan of him myself, like I remember when I told you last time, like when the year that you did the short with him, I met him like a year prior, yep. as a fan, uh, as we both were, uh, of Kurt. And yep. one thing you mentioned last time when you interviewed The Rock, which wasn't in the film, but you said uh, one of the things that Rock said to you that was stuck with you is, you have to be a good person in wrestling to sustain to have a long career, to have longevity. Now that the film is out, and we like we know Kurt is that good person, we know, and he's had that like, longevity, but now that the film is out, does that comment, does that thing like resonate even more? Do you see that even more, like how much, how beloved he is? And like, you know, that 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 statement of him being a good person, does that, has that had, had more of an impact, do you think? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it al- I would say that it almost seems like every single response to the film is half of a response to the film and half of a response to Kurt Angle, uh, which is a beautiful thing because mm. I would say like, you know, it's like, yes, uh, you know, people who liked the film, thank you. Um, and, but the, the, you know, and they'll, they'll say what they liked about the film, but they'll also say, um you know i looked up to you for my whole life growing up thank you so much for everything you've done it's it's almost like it's it's it, the reaction is almost like m- more so for kurt than the film uh yeah. and in a way in a in a, in a in a in a from a filmmaker's perspective you almost want that as well because you know you want to, you want to f- people to forget they're watching a a, a movie or a documentary yeah. and you want you want them to res- to respond to the the actual subject and the story um and you know this the the wave of uh of love that he's gotten for himself not for the film but for himself has been uh has been a special thing and he has uh expressed those sentiments to me as well 
Yeah, no, I I hundred percent agree, and you do get lost in it. I remember you saying you wanted this to be like a sports epic. You didn't want it to feel like a documentary. And I was just sitting there, and we're being educated about this subject or this this here this story. Um, and it doesn't feel like that. And that's I think there's multiple multiple reasons for that. I think obviously Kurt as a subject matter, just and him talking the way he does engages you. The way you filmed it is so brilliant even just like the little shots like the jersey one that you mentioned to me last time i'm mean, the singlet sorry where it comes off the chair um and of course the wrestling uh footage like you managed to acquire which you said you were so excited for us to see uh which was incredible and that i think really made it that sports epic i like i think you achieved what you set out to achieve because it didn't feel like a documentary it did feel like we were on this journey and like every time obviously cuts narrating explaining a situation we can then see it we can see the action happening because of the footage would this achievement would the sports epic kind of been achievable without that resting footage i would say no i i, I would say no i i i, I... I think that finding finding that footage is an extremely um, fun task. It's extremely difficult, but it's extremely fun. Uh, I love playing detective. I love looking for it all. And there's a lot of, like I said last time, there's probably like 30 to 40 pieces in there. Uh, the keen eye could pick out uh, that hadn't been seen before. You know, one of my favorites is Kurt's high school football game. You know, I called yeah. every. I called every high school player on that team and I was calling their work numbers and they were picking up going, who the heck are you? And <laughs> I almost gave up. And then the last guy was like, I'm pretty sure my dad used to film those games. Cause, cause he thought I was going to be a, a, a D one football player. So he wanted to have a lot of my games on tape. He's like, I could have sworn he actually filmed that one too. And the guy went up in his attic and he found that game, that exact wow. game, you know, and that, that was just those moments when you're making documentary are just so special um another one is when uh you know dan shade who's a great person by the way uh it, it, these these wrestling uh foes in this documentary are almost like you know video game bad guys uh mm -hmm. and i you know, i do build them up first as you do yeah um yeah and you have to do that filmmaking wise and they're antagonists on the map but they're not antagonists off the mat i just want to be clear about that so vessels turkey is one of the nicest people i have ever met the the college mm. foe who is six six but dan shade is a great person in real life and when he yanked on kurt's neck like that um you know he, that was something that kurt even has himself said he would do uh when it, when, it, when it happened in the olympic trials that's something that a lot of wrestlers do when they hear about an injury yeah. they try to go after that injury i will say this though that that the footage of that was actually hidden from me. Um, someone who got me the footage of the Olympic trials did not want that footage to be in this documentary. So oh, and, wow. it, it, and and they knew that it hadn't been out there at all, and they're friends with him. So when I received the tape, I could see at the beginning of the tape that there was a cut in the footage. Uh, you know, any editor can kind of tell that there was a splice in the actual uh, beta tape. Wow. Um, and that was very clear to us. So we started me, the editor and myself, Ian Winber, who's a genius. I love him. He, he, we started digging into uh, that match in other formats and to see if we could find it anywhere. And we couldn't find it anywhere. Then we came upon this VHS tape one day. There was actually like in Kurt's mother's basement. Um, and it just very simply said a bunch of stuff. It was a bunch of stuff on a VHS tape. She had filmed a lot of stuff. And the, her, the Olympic trials matches happened to be one of the things in there. And then we put the match in and we realized right away that the filming, unlike any other tape we've seen, the filming started before the match and our jaws dropped and we were sitting there waiting for it to uh, show up. And there it was. And he, and because we were so confused, we were like, Kurt keeps describing this thing where this guy's trying to yank his neck and yeah. basically rip his head off. And we weren't seeing it, but we could tell that we could tell that that splice was there in the footage. So when we found that, when you watch the film, you'll notice that the shots of that are extremely low VHS resolution when it's happening. Yes, yeah. And suddenly it cuts to high resolution for the rest of the match. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that's actually true, and that, that's and that's one of the things I think one of the moments where I think the footage is so impactful in making it feel like that sports epic because. Kirk could describe it all you want and you can somewhat picture it and piece that together in your mind. But if you don't see it, it's not the same. 
Correct. It's not the same. Um, but I will give Kirk props for his interview because his yeah. interview is like, you know, it's the tree trunk in this film and we created all the tree branches off of that. And I mean, it, it, the more I like, the more I watch it and the more I think about it, the more I see people's reactions to it. I, I really think that the interview we captured with Kurt in itself is like a special thing uh, mm -hmm. that he gave to us. Uh, and to do it over like, you know, to do it, we did like a nine hour stretch one day and then like a seven hour stretch the next day. All, I don't know what it was about the environment or why Kurt chose uh, this venue to really, um, you know, open up about everything. But was it at like a wrestling? Was it at like a wrestling gym or like a like a rest on wrestling match? Was that what it was? Yeah. And that's what it looked like. I wanted to do it at Kurt's um, high school in Mount Lebanon, uh, and we did get shots at Mount Lebanon, but uh, you know, just red tape. We weren't able to film in there at the time because of y'all. You know, it's, it's a it's a complicated thing to be filming during a school year, you know. So sure, I totally, sure, sure. I totally understand that one. <laughs> uh, but there happened to be another Pennsylvania uh, high school that was right across the road, and we uh, we went there, and we, they had a wrestling room, and I walked inside of it, and I was like, wow, this is like a very. It was extremely intimate setting. It was extremely closed off. It was ex it was completely pitch black, which means in filmmaking, pitch black is like gold because you can light it ever uh, however you want. And, you know, it just, it just, it just clicked. It just worked. And we went in there and we filmed and, um, and we, we had, you know, we, we, we felt like it was something special at the time, but you can't really tell until, until later on when people react to it. Uh, that's always the gamble in filmmaking and, uh, it paid off and I'm so happy. Yeah, no, no, they were, it was very special and so, so genuine, so real. And one of the things that we did want to ask about the footage was Kurt's, you know, you described like the yanking of the neck. Kurt's memory of those matches is unbelievable, yeah. and I like I want to know because did did he watch those matches back with you when you got those tapes to like refresh himself, or was that just all because little things like I think it was the Olympic match I can't remember what round, but it was where he was it was against the Russian, yeah. and he describes where the Russian has his hands on his head in like oh my god I've just given up this lead to Kurt, yeah. and like but that memory I'm just like like he's it's just so pinpoint and obviously then you show the footage and it's exactly as he describes it yeah. and i was like i was just blown away by his like it was so vivid yeah you're the uh I, you're only like the i would say first or second person to ask me this question i'm i'm, I'm uh, it's a fantastic question because it's something that the editor and i talk about all the time because our minds were blown by it too but as we discussed it we were like this kind of makes sense and, and, and you'll see it I, I think you'll see a correlation with this among a lot of like the super athletes because mm -hmm. they're competing at, at such a level that the adrenaline is so unbelievably high at the time that those memories are stored in such a way that like, you know, a memory for you and I would be stored if we went through some experience in life that just had so much adrenaline involved with it. Uh, if you've ever been through like, you know, uh, a scary situation or anything like that, uh, or a high intensity situation, uh, like a car crash or something, that memory is so stored deeply in my mind. And I feel like these super athletes, the adrenaline is just their, their hearts are just pounding out of their bodies as they're going through these high intensity matches. And the, the, the question that I, I mean, I love answering this question because the answer is no. Kurt did not watch any of this. And Kurt didn't wow. even, Kurt, the, the tape didn't even exist for him to watch it because I didn't find a lot of this tape, uh, like the like the like like his match where he breaks his neck at the US Open. I didn't find a lot of it, you know, outside, I, I, I didn't find a lot of it until way after the fact uh, from his interview. The only tape that like truly exists as like a pop culture thing is his gold medal match. Uh, but even in that, you know, he would say things that you wouldn't find in the NBC coverage and that you would find in like these small, tiny, like foreign country coverages that I would find later on. Uh, so I believe that that's where that type of memory comes from. Kurt himself will tell you that, you know, his memory is a lot different for his years that he was abusing pills. Uh, you know, the memories don't exist nearly. It's almost like the opposite effect. The memories yeah. that almost like don't even store themselves at all in those years. And when he's seeing footage of himself in that state, he is seeing it for the first time. Yeah. And that's why that had such a big effect on him.
So oddly enough, when he watched the first half of the film, it was like he was expecting every moment. And then oddly enough, when he watches the end parts of the film, that's when stuff starts popping up that he himself wasn't expecting to see as much because those are the memories he has less stored just because of the way his mind worked in those times. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, actually. And it's a fascinating thing. But yeah, I, mean, I guess also because, yeah, like you said, he was so, in that time, he was probably never more sharp mentally, physically. And we yeah. saw, obviously, the training that he was doing. I mean, if if you ever you want to feel like you're not working hard enough or watch that. <laughs> so no, no, that True. makes a lot of sense. True. Yeah, yeah. I mean, his... I, well, one thing I was going to say, like you said, you did obviously this whole uh, journey it does is more focused on this whole film is more focused on his journey to the Olympics, like that whole that whole journey. And a big part of it is the fox catcher yeah. uh, part, uh, where obviously uh, there's uh, is it, uh, oh goodness, sorry, Dan, Dan Schultz, yeah, Dan, oh, David Schultz, David Schultz, sorry, David Schultz, sorry, yeah, sorry, Dan, Dan, obviously, Dan, 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 Dan. yep, yes, my apologies, yeah, David Schultz obviously was was murdered, and yeah. well, you mentioned in an interview with when you did on Cuts podcast, and obviously we, a lot of people know anyway. There's been so many films about Foxcatcher and about that incident, about um, you know, there was documentaries, films. There was even a film I think I think Stephen Carell was in, and uh, quite a big one, quite a few years ago. But obviously, you mentioned as well that the the mention and the involvement of Kurt has never really been spotlighted. The fact that he's probably, in many ways, the biggest celebrity to come out of that. Like st still today, worldwide, he's there's probably no one bigger than Kurt as far as who was involved in that sure. that sure. that group. Do you think because we talked we spoke about this a little bit last time? Do you think that the, that's Kurt's involvement in that is not as uh, as spotlighted, and also the fact that his his tale has not been told up until now uh, by anyone else? The Olympic journey, at least, is because for so long wrestling has been viewed as professional wrestling. That is, this is uh, has been viewed in such a negative light, and there's, there's been stigma against it that they almost kind of pushed Kurt away from the narrative whenever they explored it. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's probably, you probably hit the nail on the head with half of it. Um, I would say it's 50% that, uh, I would say it's 50% that, uh, you know, when Kurt left to go be a professional wrestler, a lot of these real wrestlers uh, really didn't want to hear from him ever again. They, uh, you know, they were, they, I mean, they, they, I shouldn't go that far. They, they loved the guy because they really liked his, you know, they, they really liked him as a person. Yeah. Uh, but they, they they were disgusted by the move uh, because that is what um, amateur wrestlers do. That's what amateur wrestlers do. They get very mad when uh, someone goes to pro wrestling. Obviously, over the years, Kurt has made it a lot more acceptable to make that move. Hmm. Um, you know, if I was going to do an extended version of this, I would dig more into that whole dynamic uh, as he, you know, transformed from one to the other. Um, I actually already had uh, uh, quite a bit more about that transition in my uh, rough cut of this documentary. Hmm. Um, so in that transition period is fa is fascinating. But I would say that the other 50 percent is the fact that when like, you know, when Foxcatcher really uh, burst onto the pop culture scene, you know, there was a movie made about the story and then there was multiple documentaries about it. I should also mention that the documentary Team Foscatcher on Netflix is the same producer that, uh, same two producers that produced our movie Angle. Wow. Uh, so there's a direct connection with the two films. Uh, but when those, in that specific time period that all of those were being made, uh, there was two documentaries. One was called Prince of Pennsylvania uh, by ESPN. It was a 30 for 30. And the other one was called Team Foscatcher. It was on Netflix. And then there was also a movie called Foxcatcher that was made by uh, one of my favorite directors alive. And it was starring Steve Carell, uh, Mark Ruffalo as Dave Schultz and Channing Tatum. Yeah. And uh, all of those happened right at the same time. And that was when Kurt was going through his most tumultuous time in life uh, as far as his addiction goes. And he was in and out of jail. He was in and out of jail four times in a span of uh, four or four or five years. And that was right when all that was happening. So, and Kurt himself would tell you that his, uh, at the time, his reputation was tarnished. Yeah. And people from uh, that side, people from the filmmaking world didn't really want to reach out to Kurt at the time because of those reasons. Sure. Uh, you know, but, uh, but um, at, 
you know, if uh, if those were all made today, I'm sure that they would reach out and have them. At least, you know, it, it would at least be fun. Even if Kurt's not a main character in Foxcatcher, it would be so fun to ex- have an actor playing him as a side character or a cameo. You know, yeah. just because that would just blow so many people's minds. And yeah, you know, but but I mean, that's nothing against those films because those films are fantastic. They're really yeah. fantastic, and the the film Foxcatcher is is truly amazing for for anyone who hasn't seen it. It's from the uh the director of i believe uh, this, it was the director of capote and moneyball so um really really fantastic films and the docs are fantastic as well yeah no fair and that's i think that's yeah that's a valid answer actually and you did mention the interviews there that kurt did and they were fantastic and i've never i mean kudos to you and kurt and everybody involved that i've never seen kurt so just open and so i pour his heart so much and like i said he was it was just riveting i was like hooked on every single word that he said um was there ever a moment that i and i know by that point you did know kurt and you knew how how much of an open book he was but was there ever a moment that you were surprised by the his depth and almost the move emotion uh like behind his words and stories of, uh, throughout that process because i mean there was some heavy heavy stuff and the most the doc is very very emotional yeah i was definitely surprised uh because I, as someone who thought I knew the story in and out, um, there are certain aspects of the story that, you know, I was very surprised at. Now, what might be a fascinating answer is that um, a couple of those things I was surprised at, uh, that were very, very long answers, aren't even in this version of the documentary. And oh. I probably would include in the extended version. Um but, you know, when, when Kurt went, you know, Kurt, 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 during when you're interviewing someone, it's not often that an answer from them lasts five to 10 minutes for one question. And with Kurt, that, you know, was, oh, you know, it, it happened almost in like organically and it, it was almost a normalcy throughout those two days. Uh, you know, we, we interviewed him for a third day later on as well. Um, you'll see some of the interview shots are different, but you know, it was almost a normalcy for him to answer a question totally and completely and spend five to 10 minutes opening up about it. And, you know, one of those was definitely about his, uh, the whole story with his sister. Uh, you know, I, that was one of the many stories I knew on a surface level hmm. uh, that I was shocked to uh, hear him go that in depth about. And I really tried to get that across that depth across, you know, sometimes that's a gamble as a filmmaker, because when you go so far in depth about one topic, you lose, you, you, you know, you, you lose a lot of time on other topics, yeah. but that was one that I felt like, you know, sometimes you just need to, you know, for a movie that's so, uh, you know, intent on being exciting. Mm. Sometimes you do need to just let the camera linger on the face and just listen. And, picking out those moments to do that is very it, it, it's you know it's it's it, it's a it's a special part of the filmmaking process and we do the same thing with when Kurt's going through withdrawal and that's another uh answer to your question um where you know he brings you through that withdrawal process and he, you know the way he brings you through it is even longer than I spent on on it in the film yeah and I could when he, like his words went through me I would say like I I could really you know I could really feel what he was, even someone who hasn't experienced hardcore opiate withdrawal, I could feel what he meant for yeah. sure. Um, and I always view that withdrawal scene as, you know, his final wrestling match in a way, because uh, the film is just full of wrestling match, whether it be amateur or pro. And he goes through all these different battles with all these different villains, but that match is just completely him versus himself and there's no footage to cut to. I just wanted to make sure that final wrestling match was just going to be between him and the lens. And I I just, uh, you know, that was one of the ones that I was, uh, I was forward by. Wow. I mean, and now that you say, I mean, there is some incredible symbolism behind that with you just it's him and the lens because that battle was just himself, him and himself. And he had to overcome that. I, I, the the first half of the the film is you know to put it in film structure terms the first half of the film is very much the physical battle and the mm. second half of the film is very much the internal battle 
And I was scared going into it because that's a very unique structure for a film. Yeah. You know, film has, you know, it almost has its climax in the middle. uh, If you're talking about the Olympic gold medal. Yeah. Uh, That's where Kurt's life climaxed in a way. And he would say that as well. You know, it's always been about chasing that high that happened like early on in his life. He kind of says it in the documentary as well, if you will, because he's like, he does that bit where he's like, I won it. And I'm like, now what? And it's kind of like what you're saying now. Yeah. Yeah. And and I I was, I was scared going in with that structure because it, you know, it's a, it is a unique structure as a, as a, as a, with a, for a film going audience to experience. Um, And you don't, you know, you don't leave the film with the same high necessarily that you had in the middle of the film. Uh, and I thought about it for a long time and a colleague of mine brought up, he goes, have you ever seen the movie Room with Brie Larson? And I was like, yeah, I have seen that movie. It's terrific. Uh, and it actually, that's the most direct comparison I've ever heard structure wise, because the first half, the, the movie Room with Brie Larson, uh, the first half of it is her physical battles of her trying to escape. Uh, she's held captive with her son in a basement. Hmm. And the first half of the movie, it, you think the whole movie is going to be about her trying to escape that basement. But spoiler, I'm sorry for anyone who has <laughs> she does escape halfway through the movie. And the, Damn the it, high, Alex. <laughs> exactly, I'm sorry. The high you experience is just so unbelievable midway through the movie. And you're like, where the heck is this thing going to go for the second half? And then you realize that the second half is about them adjusting to the outside world that they haven't experienced for 17 years. And our film and you know the film ends up on a ends up on a bittersweet but also very hopeful note. And our film kind of has that same structure where it goes up like this. It's like a triangle. It goes up like this, and then it peaks halfway, and then it slides down very harshly. But then mm-hmm. at the last, at the end, it kind of takes this upswing again. And then you, I want I wanted you to feel as if you like you're 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 ending on that upswing, and you're gonna see where it goes next. Yeah. And hopefully, uh, hopefully, Kurt feels that way about his life. Yeah, no, and it, it definitely feels that way. And and you mentioned earlier that about the uh, one of the surprising things being uh, the story about the sister, and that's actually one of the things that caught me was the story that he wrestled Brock Lesnar in a sixty minute Ironman match the day after yeah. his sister passed away. Yeah. Just the yeah, that, I'm, I and I remember watching that match when I was very young. Yeah. And like that, that SmackDown, and because I used to watch it every you know, SmackDown right. every week, and I was so excited to see that match. And now knowing, like, oh my god, like yeah. a day before, yeah. that's what he experienced, and he did that. Yeah, I mean, so this this all amazing tool that I had at my disposal as a filmmaker was uh, was to take WWE footage and show it under the context of almost reality instead of the context that it's shown under in WWE. Now I Mm. love, I I love all the context it's shown up under WWE. I'm a wrestling fan myself, Uh, but you know, it's the context of fiction and another example of footage that like, it's almost surreal to even that it even exists is after Kurt's going through his neck surgeries and you're watching him unconscious laying on this bed with anesthesia over his face and you're watching him in the middle of these neck surgeries and then he wakes up from the surgery and a camera and microphone is immediately put in his face and he's interviewed and he can barely speak because the surgery went through his neck to work on his neck through through the through his throat to work on his neck um and you're watching this and you're like dude i i I, you can't even believe what you're seeing at some point I, i don't even really realize that people if people really truly understand what they're seeing when they see that, and I give all the credit in the world for to WWE for yeah. one filming that and two letting us use it, because yeah. in WWE, as as many wrestling fans know, real life things that pop up sometimes, wrestling takes it and uses it as an angle, mm. and that happened to be one of the things they used at the time as an angle. Uh, this guy's going through all these neck surgeries. Will he be back in time to work yeah. on his face? But when you watch the footage in the context that was it was used back then, it was under that fun wrestling context. But it was I, the it was the epic it, comeback, wasn't it? Like that that's how they kind of spin the yeah. But the tool that I get to take it and use it as is the context of reality as Kurt explains it from his human personal story. And that was a great 
tool to, for me to be able to use. Take this footage that was shown under a completely different context in the past mm. and then put it under the context that we see it in as yeah. human beings. We watch the story unfold. And to sit there and to watch a, a camera be in this guy's face as he you know, wakes up from his neck surgery and talk about his life like immediately and his voice is his uh, horse uh, was mind blowing to me. And I'm hoping it strikes some other people as that when they see this. Yeah. Well, I mean, in maybe not that specific footage, but it did. Do you have that technique has certainly worked on me? Cause that's my perspective. How did I change looking at that Iron Man footage? And I was like, Oh my God, like that's what he was going through. And I mean, one of the things that struck me again is, and we, it's one of those things where we mentioned earlier about the broken freaking neck. Like yeah. we all know it, but then we don't really know it. Like we don't know the depth of it. And this, we all know the fact that he rests, he won the Olympics with a broken neck. And we all know that WrestleMania 19 against Brock Lesnar, he did it with a broken neck. But I kind of just, I, th I think after the film and when I just started thinking about it, I was like, so if we look at it, his two biggest professional accomplishments and moments olympic gold medal and then professional wrestling main eventing wrestlemania yeah. he had to do both and accomplish both yeah. with a broken neck like the, the yeah. fact that it happens once is unheard of or unlike just unbelievable yeah. it happened yeah. twice and he yeah. did it with flying colors both times like that is absolutely unreal like i actually yeah. we like we know it but now you have to if you break it down in that context it's ridiculous like how on earth did he do it and come out both sides like and, and successfully come out and do it and thank god still be healthy it's absurd yeah, the, the parallel is absurd i'm glad you pointed it out because it is absurd the editor and i would talk about it all the time the, the parallel is just it's it's it, it's like one in a trillion in any possible universe that that would happen to a person and uh, you know i talked earlier about that filmmaking structure and the structure of this film is sort of like a triangle where it goes up it climaxes and then it goes down and those two things you're talking about happen almost at the parallel time in that triangle. Yeah. Like it happens like right here on the way up and like right here on the way down is his neck breaks before he gets mm. into the addiction and stuff. And so if you drew a, if you drew a line across, they would probably be at the exact same point. So, I mean, it's just, it's just mind blowing that, um, you know, that, that, that parallel exists. And uh, as a filmmaker, it almost scares me that I'm never going to find a story that's, like has so many dimensions like this. Yeah. Like, it's just so unbelievable. And that's one of the reasons I hope to dig into it further as well. Yeah. And then that's another thing of why I'm just like so mind blown. I'm like, how has no one before you yeah. had the foresight to be like, this needs to be something. This we need to showcase this to like in, in terms of a biopic or whatever. Cause it is absolutely Unlike when Ric Flair said, it makes my story look lame. Like maybe, I don't know if there's a hundred percent truth to that, but there might be truth to that. And I understand where he's coming from when he, when you think about it from this perspective. True. Yeah. I mean, you got to give Ric, Ric Flair beat death twice. So you got to give him props. Yeah. absolutely. Um, but, but yeah, the, the, the density of Kurt's story and uh, you know, uh, you know, it blew my mind when I was looking into it, it blew my mind. I was like, this is such fertile ground for storytelling and, you know, I, it was, it, it blew my mind that no one had really dug into this yet. And maybe Kurt, you know, in terms of like overall pop culture, Kurt, like, you know, Kurt Angle is the type of guy who like probably like seeps just under the radar, you know, when it comes to like humongous stardom. Yeah. And that at the end of the day is probably the reason that no one had dug in at this level mm -hmm. to his life before. Um, but I knew we had, some, I, I mean, I felt that we had something on our hands right away. And then when I pitched it to like, you know, I, I was able, I was lucky enough to be able to pitch it to like, I would say seven or eight producers. And every single one of them said they wanted to do it. Uh, and some of them were not even wrestling fans whatsoever. I, I would say the majority wow. of them weren't even wrestling fans. Uh, and they just saw something in it right away. Uh, now, I was blessed to end up with uh, a guy who was a huge wrestling fan. Um, and is an extremely prolific uh, documentary uh, fil uh, filmmaker in Hollywood and a producer and uh, just a just a special man in our in our business uh, named Ross Dinnerstein. And uh, he he saw something in it right away for sure. And when I pitched it to him and what I'm even more impressed about was that he took someone who was like as green as me and um, kind of just let me run with it. He kind of just let me run with it. Um, so 
uh, I appreciate the opportunity that they gave both me and Kurt uh, to to pull this off. I mean, you say call yourself green, but I mean, no one would know it watching this film, man. <laughs> well, green in terms of future filmmaking, but none none of us yeah. filmmakers are green. We we battle for twenty yeah. years before we battle for twenty years before uh, before something happens, yeah. and, uh, and and you know what? I, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. So. Uh, whether you pay me for it or not, uh, I just it's what I love to do. So, no, and I'm glad because if this is anything to go by, I want more and more from you, Thank man. You, it's awesome. Thank you. And you, I one of the things that just popped back in my head though is uh, you talked about having those moments where you decide to leave it on Kurt, right? Just just have him, just see him, just see him talk. Yeah. And it was it's kind of comical in a way, or the way the way it comes across is a bit comical. But you just leave the camera on him, and he just sits and he's listing off all his injuries. Yeah. And he's like, two broken necks. I tore this. I tore that. I did this. I did this. I broke all my teeth. And then he kind of chuckles about it at the end. But again, I again, I was laughing, but I was also like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, what on earth has happened? Like, the injury. Yeah. Oh my God. I, can't, I just can't like fathom it. Like, how just experiencing one of those, let alone all of those. Yeah, I was, I, I, it is mind blowing. And to be candid, there is a much longer version of that scene. Oh, wow. Uh, much longer. <laughs> uh, the much longer version lasts about uh, three and a half minutes. Uh, you know, maybe they'll see the light of day someday, but who knows? Um, but but yeah, all, cause, because not only Kurt, but a, a, a lot of those guys, every single guy that we interviewed has that story uh, when it comes to the <laughs> wrestling side of things. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's, you know, Kurt's, Kurt's injuries... Uh, you know, there, there, there's a parallel, like I said, with with every professional wrestler when it comes to that, and what they went through, um, and I, I would say that the longer sequence probably will never see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's for the better. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it, you, you know what. It, it, in terms of this uh, film, I actually agree with uh, with with the note that I got to cut that because uh, because it strays a little too much from Kurt Angle's story. Sure. Um, because it really it really was the only scene that really delved into all of the professional wrestlers. Uh, so it took me forever to find all the footage. Um, <laughs> that's the only reason I'm a little bit bummed out about it. <laughs> but, but I agree with the note because, yeah. because it, it, you know, it, I, we were trying to tell the most streamlined version of Kurt's story possible. And that strayed a little bit too much for that. Fair, fair. One thing, I don't know if, I don't know if you ever saw this, like, I mean, you may have, right? Cause it, Mick Foley's first ever book, um, have a nice day, I believe it was called. Yeah. Um, on the back of that, I don't know if it was on every single version of the book, but it's certainly on the paperback version. On the back of it, it's just got a picture of him, and then it's got like a mind map of of, of his body, different body parts of all the yeah. injuries he's had. Yeah. That's all I was thinking of when Kurt did that because I was like, "Wow, Kurt, you could have your own Mick Foley mind map of like all the injuries." He could, he could, and they all could. I mean, we. Uh, I mean, I read that book when I was fourteen years old, and um, I, I was blown away by that book at the time, uh, Mick Foley's book. And yeah. Kurt could have that. All of them could have that. One yeah. thing, uh, one thing, one thing that didn't make the final cut that we had was our, we we got to interview Rob Van Dam for this. Um, he, you know, he, he his story wasn't it intertwined quite enough with Kurt enough to uh, for him to be in the final cut. But when he was talking about his injuries, which took place in ECW, uh, man, were they extensive! <laughs> man, yeah. were they extensive it's in his ECW days? Yeah. And and we did have like this. At one point, he's pointing at the screen. Um, he's pointing at the he, he's pointing up in the air like this, and he's he's saying the doctor put up his uh, his uh, his MRI, and the doctor was going through it and pointing out all the different things in his body uh, that were wrong. And <laughs> we kind of we we put a CG uh, we CGI'd a um, a uh, MRI scan yeah. uh, that's floating in front of him as he's doing it. And, and he's, he's pointing, pointing to the, all these points. Oh wow! And it's just like one of the coolest images. I'm, I was a little bit bummed that 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 specifically was cut out of the film, but it was. It's one of the coolest images when you see it. It reminds me of what of what you were saying. Uh, and but what, what was fascinating was the line he ends with. He's like, "That's not even why I'm here." He's like, "I was because <laughs> of this." <laughs> <laughs> My gosh! Wow. I will. I mean, if it somehow comes, even if it's just the RVD clip, I maybe hope that part could come out. Yeah, maybe just that. Maybe just yeah, like yeah. an RVD share on social media. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll look into it. That would but be cool. uh, yeah. 
But one of one of the stories that during that time, the next stuff that really um took me aback, and and I also I guess I mean I I can't say if it's the truth or not, but it, it certainly felt like the truth when it's when Steve Austin talks about Kurt's neck surgery, yeah. and Kurt, Steve is just like he didn't agree with the approach that Kurt was taking and what they were doing because he was like it was just a patch job. Yep. He's like it wasn't it wasn't he wasn't fixing it. He was just you know, putting the band-aid on kind of thing and hoping that it stays together. And obviously it never did. But I just felt the analogy and the honesty in which that, in which Steve delivered with that, like with that story and his perspective, it just fits so well in the time. And it just really painted like almost maybe the chaotic nature of Kurt's life and what, you know, the erratic kind of decisions maybe he was making and things like that. It was just really hit home. And it was, it was actually something I never really thought of, but Maybe I kind of had it in the back of my mind, and I was like, "Well, why, why didn't you just do this surgery?" Or and then, but then obviously Steve just points out, and the fact that he's been through it himself, it just yeah, it really landed. That really had an impact for me. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really difficult decision. Maybe in a non pro wrestling audience, I think struggles sometimes with that decision. Sure. Um, because they don't really understand as well like the ins and outs of the pro wrestling world. Uh, but I think the pro wrestling audience understands that decision mm. and because when, when you, you know, it, it changes your whole life, you know, yep. when you're, when you're a guy who's on Kurt's level, you know, who's a, he, he fought for years and years to be like the top guy in the company and stuff like that. And, you, you know, it, 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 it makes sense that you want to hold on to that, uh, you know, at all costs. And if a, doctor comes along and tells you that, Hey, like I can fix this and you will be, you'll be good. You'll be good. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to do this. Um, I mean, you can relate it right now to Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback in the jets, he, he, you know, he, he went down with, he ruptured his Achilles last week. And um, what's his immediate mindset? His immediate mindset is I am extremely disappointed by this. And now I'm going to do everything possible to come back. And he had surgery you know, they, they rushed the surgery and they had a surgery a couple of days later. Uh, and it was an experimental surgery on top of that. Uh, it was someone, it was some doctors calling up Aaron Rodgers, just like Kurt Angle got the call saying, do you want to make it back for the playoffs this year? Cause I can at least try to get you there. You know, it would be a miracle, but I can try to get you there. And he said, yes. And these guys who were like, you know, Jr. has the line in our documentary, uh, these guys who are at that elite level, they they think in a different way. They think yeah. in a different way when it comes to that stuff. Uh, you know, safety isn't quite on their mind. And Ronda Rousey talked a lot about this in her interview. Um, and I wish I, you know, could have found a way to include that a little bit more. Uh, I wish that about so many things. <laughs> um, but, you know, she talks about how like, you know, you know, her body is like, you know, her, her, uh, you know the, it's not like it's it's not even worth it unless your body is like broken to pieces she's like saying basically and i'm like jeez really i've never mm. really felt that way in my life you know i've always mm. been someone who thinks about safety at all times and mm. you know longevity but these these supreme athletes are just they're just thinking on a different level like that and it it's probably the reason that they win gold medals and win bronze medals yeah. and win everything that they win in their life i guess i mean i i, I guess i understand i understand why he did it but I think maybe the reason it imp- it resonated more or was felt more impactful was because it came from Steve. Yeah. And Steve was is very much in the same vein, right? He was like, and he explained that as well. Like, I understand being at the top and I don't want to go away and it's career suicide, things like that. Yeah. But then he still said it. And I was like, oh, wow. So I think maybe that's why it hit me more because I was like, oh, but you still think that way, that he should have done this. So it was yeah, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's the benefit of hindsight. Maybe Steve wouldn't have said it X many years years ago, but it's still fascinating. It is, and the parallel between those two men, you know, it, dealing with a very similar situation was fascinating too. Now, man, the neck fusion is a difficult decision. It's extremely difficult decision to make because it mm. it truly does end your professional career, uh, um, and it 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 you know pretty much ended Steve Austin's career when he did it. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think today he would still say that he thinks, you know, he, I, I think he expressed in his interview that he thought Kurt should have done it at the time. And I, I do think that's his thoughts today. You know, Steve Austin, I think he's happy with his, how his fusion went, how his life went, everything like that. Um, 
you know, but he, he it's, 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 you know, it, it's understandable from Kurt's perspective. Steve Austin was, Steve Austin was through the roof, like in, enormous, like the biggest yeah. draw in the history of pro wrestling, mm-hmm. a huge pop culture phenomenon outside of pro wrestling. And if I'm thinking about Kurt's mindset at the time, I'm thinking about, okay, I may, I'm the guy who's kind of like on the verge of all of this, you yeah. know? Uh, I'm like operating right there where I'm like, on like the head, like the, I'm headlining WrestleMania. I'm on the verge of headlining WrestleMania and my life could just like explode into all these different possibilities. So in that case, like, you know, they, the two guys had like a fork in the road where it, mm. even when they even had the exact same doctor, which is a yes. yeah. crazy parallel as well, but they had that fork in the road, where, you know, Steve Austin went this way and he felt that was best for his life and Kurt went this way because he felt like that was best for his life. Now mm-hmm. that did that eventually lead Kurt on a path to abusing uh, painkillers as he did potentially? Mm. Yeah, no, that's fair to say. One thing I want to go back to is, and and one thing that really um, I loved, and it and was the ending that you did. Okay, was was brilliant. It was, and you, I know you mentioned in the uh, your podcast with Kurt was that was the ending that you were really glad that uh, the A and E bio didn't use because you were like, oh yes, like my endings, uh, you obviously feel it, it's a lot better. And I do agree that I, I think it was a lot more impactful. I love the way you did it, and awesome. it was it was as you wanted it to be, it's cinematic, feel like a big epic film, like feature film, like a uh, um, and the what it reminded me of, and I don't know if this was an inspiration for you. Was it reminded me of uh, the movie The Wrestler? I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> because at the end of that movie, it's Mickey Rourke climbing the top rope slowly, yep. and he dives, yep. and then as he's in the air, it fades to black, and we end. And in this one, it's Kirk as Kurt's narrating, or the voiceover of Kurt speaking. It's Kurt climbing the cage yep. to do the moonsault, and he dives the moonsault, and yeah. Yeah, fade to, and you fade to black. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, Darren Aronofsky is one of my favorite filmmakers, not just the wrestler, but his entire mm. filmography. And I have been following him. He's like one of my gods. I've been following him religiously forever. Mm. Um, so I love Darren Aronofsky. I love the movie The Wrestler. Uh, and uh, well, oddly enough, though, uh, it you know it, it kind of accidentally fell into that comparison. Oh, uh, I wasn't leaning for that. I wasn't aiming for that. As a matter of fact, I wasn't even going to have, I wasn't even aiming to have this be the ending of our film. Uh, I had a whole different ending in mind and that was complicated and I had, I had to go film it and all that stuff. And I said, I said in the, I had ended my first sizzle reel, which is like a thing you make to pitch this Mm. documentary. I had ended that the same way that our film now ends with Kurt diving off the cage. Uh, And as a placeholder, I texted the editor one day and I was like, can you just take that and put it in as our ending for the rough cut? Cause we need, we need it to end in order to show it for a test screening. We just needed to shove in an ending in time. And we didn't film my other ending yet. Um, so we, we just toss it in there and then we toss it in there and we went, this got to be the ending. This has to be the ending. <laughs> and uh and i actually because i'm so stubborn i actually did go film that other ending after the fact yeah and then we did try to jam it in for like a day and within you know by lunchtime we were like clearly this isn't gonna fly nearly as well as what we just had in there yeah so uh, uh, yeah i'm happy that ending is in there i think it's a i think it's a nice parallel when you see him do the backflip after he wins the world championship and then you see him doing the uh cage dive backflip when he first enters mm-hmm. wwe in that cage yeah. match and then the third time you see it is kind of like the, the third pal of him doing it at the very end so it's kind of like the the three different buttons and then the period on the sentence nice no and i, I you know what and I, part, I, I really admire that about you as well like your your dedication to it is well even though like this ending was great but then you still did your own still did your own one and it doesn't work and then you go back but like your commitment to every element of it it's it's very admirable and i respect that greatly and it comes through yeah. in your work so yeah, yeah, yeah. uh i really kudos. appreciate it i really appreciate it and i, wa- I just want to mention that filmmaking is a village by the way everyone who's in filmmaking knows this and mm. the the amount of work that other people put in is is insane and and, yes. and i especially want to give props to uh the editor his, he, i got to edit this with one of my best friends which is an amazing experience wow, that's uh, nice. his name's ian winber i grew up with with him in uh in massachusetts and we grew up as you know filmmakers together and we were always be making films together and um when you get to work with someone who uh who you've worked with over a long time like that 
um, even if it's your first feature doc together, there's such an unspoken language. It's almost like, like, it feels like, like two guitarists on both sides of the stage, like going back and forth, like soloing with each other. And that is kind of the way that we felt throughout this. So, uh, so what, what an incredible job, uh, he did editing this and, uh, he blew my mind with some of the, some of the things that he, he put together. Yeah. And no, music, yeah. Yeah. Well. Oh yes. Yes. The cat angle, uh, theme mer mer like yep. merged into, yeah, no, it was yep. very nice. Very yeah. nice. One person had a, such a funny comment that they, it, one person was like, I, I really like the theme, but I can't help but imagine a choir singing you suck to it. <laughs> because of, because of the cinematic plays. I thought that was an amazing comment. That's great. Someone, someone should actually try to put that in behind. That would, that would be cool. <laughs> and one of the things that, I mean, I guess, I mean, and as you commented the last time we spoke, as we see a lot of my background is yeah. the, the rock. Yeah. And so knowing that you got to interview the rock for this, a fresh new interview that he, yeah. you know, he, you got to do with them for this film and the where rock is in his life and career now. And the fact that this was obviously an independent film, very DIY and that you got to have that opportunity blew my mind. Yeah. And of course, obviously he not only does, did you have that opportunity and do you have him in the film? Some of his insight input is just brilliant. It's so good. What was that experience like? getting oh, to interview the rock like well, how was can you just explain that because I, I would say would... when i got the initial text uh from ross Dennis and the producer I, I actually like I, I almost passed out i was like <laughs> I, I, i'm not kidding i, I you know and i i, I don't I, blame you <laughs> i i was like oh my god why I, I and you know and then it just it just it made more sense to me over time that he, I mean, he said yes so quickly. Like we, we asked him and then the next day, suddenly he was going to be in this movie. And I was just like, Oh my goodness, this is unbelievable. And, um, you know, it, it, it got like, like all of the other guys and gals who said yes to this and donate their time because, you know, these are documentary interviews. We don't have, uh, we, we don't have the money that would even make them want to be paid for this, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, documentary relies a lot on, um, just love and respect and goodwill. And, uh, that goes for interviews and that goes for people you hit up for footage and everything like this. And Kurt had been nice and people respected him so much over his life, not just the rock, but all these people. And I saw really on that that was a great tool at my disposal that I was able to use, um, as a filmmaker, because I knew that when I called up a lot of these people and I, they almost had the feeling like we owe that guy one, you know? Yeah. Uh, because we like him and we've seen a lot of people. I mean, you know, the rocks met probably a kajillion people, you know? Mm. And I would say there's probably only, I'm guessing there's only a small percentage of those people that the rock would sit down and say, yes, I'm going to, you know, be late for my movie shoot, basically. Um, and like, you know, I'm he, he's a guy who gets pulled in a million different directions a day, all day, every day. And he's going to sit down with like this no name director and talk about Kurt Angle for, you know, 20 minutes or whatever it was. And, you know, it, it, it is all, it was almost surreal to me that it was happening, but it makes sense in the broader context that if you think about it, there's probably such a small amount of people that, um, he's met in his life that, you know, uh, he respects on that level and he yeah. like loves on that level because back in the day it was Kurt Angle who had the cachet because Kurt Angle was the Olympic gold medalist. You know, the mm -hmm. rock may have been on the top of the WWE, but Kurt Angle was fresh off of an Olympic gold medal. And when Kurt came in with that cachet and he didn't act like he had that cachet, that deeply affected someone like the rock who now has, that cachet and beyond that cachet right? yeah. blown to the moon. Um, and guys remember that stuff. And uh, it's, it, it, it was, it was a, I hate to say it was a tool for me, but it was, it was a great tool for me to have that at my disposal throughout the filmmaking process. Just the fact that people loved and respected Kurt and I was able to uh, uh, get stuff for, you know, whether it was footage or interviews, I was able to get, get stuff from people um for uh and have them donate their time at no cost yeah no and that's 
I'm glad you got that. And it was like I said, and he actually mentions that as well in the in the film, I believe. You say he says that he even highlights that like he came in with this perspective of like yeah. no ego and he just just learned and he's he's a fresh face and and you can see that that you can see Rock's that type of guy that that holds a lot of weight and is yeah. is is I mean, is Rock as advertised? Because I mean he just he appears like the greatest guy and I'm and I'm I'm sure he I'm sure I like to think that he is because he said the... like uh, it, it actually like, almost disappoints me sometimes when I whenever people like give him shit sometimes or anything like that online. I know those famous guys always have to get used to that, mm. uh, uh, but it almost disappoints me sometimes because like come on man, I'm like a nobody, and this guy like this guy comes up to me and he starts talking to me about my personal life, like growing up in Massachusetts. You know, his wife was from Linfield. It's just the, the, he's just he's such a positive force <laughs> for yeah. us in the world. And not only, you know, in pro wrestling world as well, like in the pro wrestling world, he's such a positive force and he's such a positive example. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't even be surprised if he ran for president one day, to be honest with you. But <laughs> the, guy, the guy is an extremely positive force uh, and he just operates throughout his entire day as a positive force. And I was like, no, I learned stuff from him uh, with just the way he operates in his life. And, um, and man, what, what, is it, is it, a, is it a, a gift that he's able to, we're able to put his face on our little tiny movie is just such an unbelievable gift, you know, and yeah. uh, his face, his name, you know, his likeness. Uh, these are extremely powerful things in filmmaking that go well beyond him sitting down um, for 15 to 20 minutes to do an interview. Uh, and not only that, you know, like, you know, he spent time with us before and after it as well. And this guy is like being literally pulled <laughs> by people mm -hmm. to move on, move on, move on. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, he, it, I think I think he's just a guy that uh, the wrestling world is is just lucky to have, and the, and the, the 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 society in general is lucky to have because he's a he's an extremely positive force, and uh, and like I said, a lot of these wrestlers are kind of like that. Deep yeah, down. Austin, Ronda Rousey, you see a correlation, you know. Even hmm. Ric Flair was very, very. Uh, he's a, he's a very positive force, and he um, he was he he was very nice to 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 meet in real life as well. No, I'm glad. And I mean, yeah, I, when people, I'm, I'm people who know, who know me, I'm a massive fan of the rock and I love to, it's great to just to hear. And like, yeah, like you said, like, you know, with obviously with no disrespect, you're obviously there's directors that are bigger than you and things of that That's nature. Cool. And, and he, and he's giving you the time of day like that. It's, yeah. it's validating as a fan to hear that and knowing that I look up to this guy and he is yeah. what I think he is. So that's awesome to yeah. hear. And on a side note, did you uh, did you watch his just return from to the WWE a couple of days ago? I did, I did. Yeah. I, I thought that was very exciting. As soon as <laughs> yeah. I saw uh, Matthew, I thought that The Rock was gonna was gonna come, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and he did. Uh, he's the man. He's the man. He's, he he's... shows up. He just shows up to life. That's what he does. He shows yeah. up, and there are a lot of people who don't. Uh, and he uh, that 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 but that was awesome. That was amazing. Yeah. That, that 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 was an amazing an amazing uh, crowd reaction as well. Yeah, no, definitely. And another guy, you uh, you emailed me this because I thought this was amazing. Another guy who's getting those massive crowd reactions right now, and he's he's hot. And but he's obviously he's been years in the making to get this point. Is L.A. Knight, and he yeah. you showed me the screenshot of him in the 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 funny like the Olympic yeah. kind of short with Kurt and RVD. Like he's a part of that, and it's yeah. just like that's insane. Like just this yeah. now, you you know, you have that kind of experience with him. Back then, you obviously had this experience with The Rock, and these two guys were just just a matter of days ago are oh, rocking the, the WWE and the talk of the town. And do you yeah. even remember the experience with LA Knight in that shoot? Because I mean, I mean, I know shoots are yeah. chaotic, and you know, obviously, it's hard to interact with everybody. Yeah, I, I do remember that experience, and he was super nice. He was a super pleasant guy. I actually like you know hung out with him a couple times after that in like uh, Los Angeles. Um, and man, that guy like make me really like proud to be like a guy who like battles for their art. And because that's what that guy did for a mm. long time. And to see him, he's really earned what's happening right now. Like he's yeah. really earned it. That guy yeah. has battled and battled and he just never gave up. And he almost did. He, I think he said recently, he was like, you know, yeah. I was, he said, I was 38 years old. It was the pandemic was starting. I was like, all right, this is it. This is it. And like, Sometimes I feel like that, like that rock bottom moment where you're like almost giving up is like right when that upswing is about to occur. And that yeah. happened to a lot of people. Um, but yeah, he was a great guy. I, I got to hang out with him for, uh, you know, the, 
the, the, the, the, the gentleman who introduced me to Kurt also was the one who asked if um, we could put Ellie Knight into uh, his name, Sean Richter, if we could put him into our uh, video at the time. And I was like, sure, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, so we kind of just like, okay, I don't think anyone has ever noticed that though. So I would be excited for someone to actually see that. It's like no. the press conference in the beginning, it's a wide shot. And Ellie Knight is standing up, holding a microphone towards Kurt. Uh, he's like in the center of the frame, boom, but he's mostly faced away from the frame, but you can tell it's him. You're looking yeah. close. Uh, but yeah, he was he was a great guy. I got to hang out with him. And at the same time, sadly enough, I, I got to hang out with Chad Gaspard for uh for a few of those same nights as well. And that is uh, you know, that that story is uh, an incredibly incredibly sad story. Yeah. Um but um I have an idea for uh for something I might want to explore with that one day as well, uh from from a filmmaking perspective. Yeah, I mean, the more I mean, as a film fan and a wrestling fan, the more if you the hybrid mix of those two that you could do, I would love because right. like the content's been spectacular thus far. <laughs> Thank you very um, much. I appreciate uh, it. And I was going to ask you, we, I mean, we've we've talked quite a few times now about like how it's crazy that Kurt doesn't have a biopic or whatever. So if I'm I'm throwing the hypothetical out there, um, if Kurt, we somehow now uh, in the future, Kurt Angle is going to have a biopic. So we're gonna we're gonna explore the journey of the life of Kurt Angle. And let's just say you're directing that as well, and we have free reign, and we can get anybody to play Kurt Angle. Who plays Kurt Angle? Who plays him? I don't know. It's an extremely difficult thing to cast. You need someone mm. who's young. You need someone who is can pull off the physicality. Um, and you know, uh, you know what I would want to do as a filmmaker. You know, I always I always look up to the filmmakers who cast someone based on acting ability and say, "You got this role if you can put on twenty five pounds of muscle." Yeah. Um, so you almost want to start out with the acting and make sure that. Uh, it's someone who could do justice to uh, the level of quality you'd want to do filmmaking wise. And then, you know, you, you give them the huge acting treatment and they, you have them gain 25 pounds of muscle. As a, uh, as a brutal filmmaker, that's what I would do. Too. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. With some poor young guy. That's what I would do. Um, I, I think it's also, you know, uh, fingers crossed. I do hope this is a, uh, is a, is a, is a biopic someday and, and mm. I hope it gets the uh, scripted treatment. Um, I think the really interesting question is if you would uh, cover his whole life in one or if you would break it up now. Yeah. It seems like, do you really want to take the exact same structure as this documentary and pass it over into a narrative film? and have it played mm. beat by beat structurally the same. Maybe it may be longer, it may be shorter, but you know, Kurt's life is organically a specific structure. So the film, a biopic would organically have the same structure as well. Would that be what you would want to do? Or would you want to do an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes, maybe even two hours, only about the Olympic story? And then ask if, if that is enjoyed, ask the question to the public, would you want to see a part two that explains yeah. everything else? Um, I think that is, I would lean that way about, I would say I would lean about that 60%. I would say right now I'm 60, 40, 60%. I would go that way. 40%. I would go the other way. Fair. No, that's not, I, 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 yeah, I would agree with that answer. And I think also the way you've broken it down, I can't, obviously I'm just thinking about it like a very, simple simplified hypothetical way but you're really breaking it down but i respect that and that's probably how that's obviously how you'd you have do? to do what would you Sorry? do instinctually what would you do would you would you do it uh in in two parts or would you do one big movie about kurt's whole life i was thinking like the television route no wrong answer i was thinking the television route like seasons maybe oh okay so like yeah, okay. maybe it'd be a series so like you do the first season olympic olympic journey second yeah. season this I, that's all when you're breaking it down i wasn't thinking films i was thinking tv shows actually that that is a great idea as well and uh i think that i think that whoever uh takes the filmmaking reins on this in the future whether i'm lucky enough to do it or whether it be somebody else um who's uh much bigger than me mm -hmm. uh i wouldn't mind whatsoever um then I, I think that that would be a very interesting way to do it as well yeah well regardless of if someone does it if or someone else does it you've created the benchmark and you started it with the documentary thank you brother so. i really appreciate that
one of the things you did say in the podcast with Kurt though, that I, I want to um, finish with is um, you talked about how documentaries have like are they at another level now? Like they're they're almost in some ways like at times on par with like a a, made, a, a big feature film, and they're, they're seen with a lot more uh, should I say uh, glory or a lot more. There's a lot more excitement behind them. Yeah. Certainly, if, I mean you know there's the nerds like us which have loved them forever, and then obviously, but people now just a general wider public uh, have are, are appreciating them. Do you think? that because there's such an influx of social, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, obviously different streaming platforms, et cetera. And the re- the level of wrestling documentaries has increased like tenfold in the last five years or so. Do you think that in a small way, that has also been a part of why documentaries have gotten to another level? Because those have been a big part and really big documentaries that have come. I mean, even just before um, your, your documentary came out on Peacock, the Cody Rhodes documentary came out on Peacock, which was really big and really publicized, and he was massive marketing. Like it was, it was a banner in New York about it and everything. Like you know, it was, and these are big, big films. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I, I actually hadn't thought about that whatsoever, but I would say that yes, wrestling documentaries probably have moved the overall needle um, in terms of uh, the popularity of documentaries in general. Now, the reason they do that, I just think, is the the stories are amazing and they just i think the stories are uh resonate with a lot of people whether they're wrestling fans or non-wrestling fans mm-hmm. and um you know it's just uh, there are so dark side of the ring is a, is a tremendous series it's a tremendous yeah. series it really is yeah. um i mean that that that, that episode the episode um that called the, there's an episode called the last of the von erics which just really blew me away yeah, uh, yeah. the older von eric telling the story of all the younger von erics mm-hmm. but uh you know these and the, even the way they do the reenactments in that series is, is like groundbreaking, I would say, in a way, you know, yeah. having the, uh, yeah. you know, using depth of field like the way they did and keeping, um, you know, keeping um, actors completely out of focus so that mm. it almost feels like it's the real Bret Hart in the background. I I, I, I actually thought that was genius. Um, yes. So there are br- groundbreaking things going on with documentaries and groundbreaking things going on with wrestling documentaries now streaming Mm. in general unfortunately has had some brutal effects on filmmaking um however that being said it has blasted open some doors uh to certain aspects of filmmaking and one of those doors it's blasted open you know it's blasted open the amount of content that can be made and it's also blasted open the door for documentary and now like to to be part of able to like, to be able to like ride this wave a little bit with my little film and have document, you know, document my documentary, not be something like niche thing that needs to be sought out by like a very small amount of people. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's amazing that, that, that I get to experience that. And it's something I want to experience for, for years. I, I, I originally thought I was just going to do scripted movies my whole life. And that's my, that was my goal. And that was my only goal. Um, and to see like when I started seeing like, I was like, man, documentaries, you can really push the envelope with documentaries and get them to feel as close to a movie as you can possibly get it. Mm. And I think that's the envelope right there. That it just needs to be continually pushed and pushed and pushed. And we, I wanted to push that envelope in this one. And I want to push that envelope even more in the next one. And uh, you know, um, it, but it, it's an interesting envelope to push though, because reenactments can be a very cheesy thing sometimes, especially with, yes. with dialogue, yes. you know, I mean, reenactments have always existed. They've existed in documentaries forever in the nineties and every, all times. And, you know, when they're used, when you use actors with dialogue and stuff like that, it just doesn't something about that. Maybe I'll do it someday. Maybe I'll try it out someday, but something about it. I really don't like, I don't like actors mm. with dialogue and documentary. No, uh, It just strikes me as very cringeworthy. It and, removes you from the story as well. Oddly enough, oddly yeah. enough, it does. You, it's almost like documentary exists in some weird middle world where you're like, you you, you, you don't want to be sucked into a fictional world because mm. you, you're living in reality. Yeah, that's that, yeah. the fictional world is for scripted movies, and you don't want to be. Your brain can't kind of like it. Almost like pulls your brain in two different ways when yes. you're seeing reenactments and then you're seeing real interviews and and all this stuff. But you are able to push that envelope on that realistic side with all these b-roll mm. shots and drone shots now which i want to implement a lot in my next thing mm. and 
you know, you know, different things you can do like dark side of the ring does with keeping those actors out of focus like that. And there's certain things that you can do to like, kind of like make that push that other side, that dramatic side to the, to the envelope without crossing over into that, into that uh, scripted world. Yeah. No, 100%. And I, I've, sp- I've spoken to guys from Dark Side of the Ring over the years. Like, I've had the good fortune of that. And I think the first time I spoke to one of the creators, Evan, I did say, like, I was not a fan of uh, reenactments in documentaries because what I had seen was just, as you said, kind of cringe and really just like, oh, I don't like this. And, but when they did it, I was like, oh, oh, it, act- oh, it can work. Like, oh my God, like, if you do it right, this is what can happen. And it's, it's revolutionary, as you said. So, um, well, I mean, maybe your next project, we'll see if that happens. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I have a different, I have a slightly different twist on it. I want to try um, for this uh, hockey documentary I, I, I may be making. So uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see if it works out. Nice. Well, I mean, can I just say again, thank you so much, Alex. I, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not going to just say this just because you're here. Uh, you, I, so you're one of the people I enjoy talking to most, man. Like your honesty, your enthusiasm, and the kindness in which you show to me, uh, in with your like openness, and it's I truly appreciate it, man. And I'm just, just yes, yeah, been a great experience every time. Thank you very much, Hamza. Likewise as well, and I hope that we can reconnect on uh, on another film in the future. Yeah, absolutely, and and then and just also thank you for the film because just yeah, spectacular. Oh, my my pleasure, my pleasure to work on this for for years. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, man.